Um, good morning or good afternoon, everybody, wherever you are in the world. Um, a very warm welcome to this EPC policy dialogue that's looking at um, Ukraine seven years after Maidan. Seven years ago, thousands of protesters were still out uh, on Maidan as part of the revolution uh, of dignity. They had been there since November. As we will all recall, it was sparked by Viktor Yanukovych, the then president of Ukraine, failing to sign uh, the association agreement with the EU. Ukrainians, um, I would say, were very fed up with corrupt, dysfunctional governance and what we could say almost certainly was, was a, criminal, a criminal state that had enough. Um, but by the end of February, uh, seven years ago, um, President Yanukovych had fled the country, went into exile in Russia. Um, a few days after that, um, Russia annexed and occupied Crimea um, and then initiated the war in the Donbass. Um, today, I would say that Ukraine uh, is definitely not the country that it was then. Many positive changes have taken place, um, but still the process of change and building a truly resilient Ukraine um, is, is a struggle. I mean, there's a struggle for Ukraine going on. Vested interests um, stroke oligarchs um, continue to do whatever they can to maintain influence. I mean, they haven't been stamped out yet. Corruption um, is proving to be a very difficult um, thing to get rid of. And of course, Russia remains an enormous challenge. Uh, the support of the international actors and of course the EU has proven to be vital um, and will continue to be so going forward. Now, today we're going to assess where Ukraine is seven years down the line. Uh, and I think we have a really excellent um, group of people with us today uh, to do this. And I'm going to briefly introduce them. Um, first of all, I'm not sure we managed to connect yet or not. We have Ambassador Mati uh, Mas Masikas, um, who is the EU uh, ambassador in Ukraine and an old friend from his Brussels days. So welcome to you, um, Mati. Uh, we also have Orisia Lutsevich, who is head of the Ukraine Forum and also a research fellow at Chatham House uh, in London. Welcome, uh, Orisia. Um, Oleksi Haran. Uh, professor at the National University of Kiev at Molya Academy. Welcome uh, to you, Alexei. It's lovely to see you here today. Um, and last but not least, um, Veronica Mobchan, Academic Director at the Institute of Economic Research and Policy Consulting in Kiev. Um, so welcome to all of you. Um, just to the audience, um, I would like to highlight how you can ask um, a question. You can either do this by typing into the dialog box that you'll see at the bottom of the screen um, or by clicking on the hand icon. I hope you'll all have you know, lots of questions and we'll take part in this, what, what I hope will be a really great discussion. And we're gonna do it to start with, I'm gonna put some questions to each of the speakers before moving to have this Q and A with the audience. Um, I would like to start with, uh, with you, um, Orisia. Um, first question I will put to you. Um, Ukraine, I would say Ukraine's re reform track um, has not been linear. There seems to have been, you know, quite a lot of steps um, going forward, or maybe one step forward um, and two steps um, back. Um, can you highlight what has been the most successful reforms that have really had concrete results over the last few years? And which reforms have suffered um, or been rolled back totally um, and why? Thank you, Amanda. Uh, welcome, everybody. Good to, to see you, colleagues. I think that it's important uh, what you have said in the introduction, in particular referring to the struggle, because I think that's, um, that describes quite well uh, the changes that are taking place in Ukraine. They're definitely not linear. They're def definitely coalitions of different forces trying to achieve a desired outcome. And this struggle is both internal and also external with Russia for Ukraine's own uh, real independence, sovereignty, and territorial integrity. So we have a lot uh, you know, uh, uh, going on at the same time. So you've asked me what I think made Ukraine better, what Ukraine has achieved since seven years of that revolution of dignity. And I would like to highlight uh, one thing especially, and that is the, preserve, the, the capacity of Ukraine to preserve 
its pluralism, dynamism, competition and democracy. At times when the country is fighting a war and is in the military conflict, it is not obvious that, uh, you know, civic space, political space would not be suppressed. So Ukraine managed to hold uh, uh, already three free and democratic elections in this time. And every time the change of power was peaceful. I mean, this is particularly striking if you look at Ukraine's neighbors and what is going on in the neighborhood. And this is actually an interesting question. Why, if you look at Belarus, you look at uh, Russia with these uh, autocracies and a lot of suppression of uh, freedom of expression. But you also look at Poland, you look at Hungary with the rise of this ethno-populism that is in a way, I think, polluting a lot of uh, democratic processes as we see it. So Ukraine stands out in this circle of neighbors as uh, I would say quite vibrant pluralistic society. And I, I, I think it's important for us to put a value on this because in a way this is a software that um, would ensure that Ukraine pushes forward uh, much needed reforms um, that Ukrainian society wants to see. Now, what I think has happened in a positive way uh, and I would um, start with the cleanup of the banking sector because it was such a, um, such a uh, symbolic and also a profitable uh, thing before. You know, they would say in Ukraine, if you want to rob a bank, you set up a bank. And Ukrainian banks were, um, they, they were tools for personal enrichment. They were not really serving the industry. And the fact that um, both President Poroshenko and President Zelensky reinstated the agency of a Ukrainian state uh, to defend justice, to defend a Ukrainian economy against the abuse of, um, you know, basically a capital flight into offshore zones, robbing Ukrainian citizens, it's very important. Second, energy uh, reform and unbundling. Again, and I refer here both to Poroshenko and to Zelensky because there is certain continuity. Uh, Ukraine was gaining its um, energy independence, starting the reform of NAFTA has. If you talk to anybody from EBRD, they will tell you that prior to Revolution of Dignity, even any discussion about an organization like EBRD being involved in any reform or any restructuring of NAFTA gas would be unthinkable. President Zelensky carried on and we have now the energy unbundling, and that is, that is very important process. Thirdly, it's decentralization. And why is it important? And I think it's, it's, it's because it really sheds the Soviet legacy of a very centralized decision-making where communities meant nothing. And this is something intrinsically, I would say, kind of a totalitarian way of running the state but something that Ukrainians always disliked because Ukraine is very horizontal society of people who feel like they can self-govern. They know it better. They don't trust the central authorities uh, to tell them what kind of uh, playground or school or uh, public park or, or they, should, they should do. So the fact that Ukraine decentralized, decentralized fiscally, which is very important, not just in terms of power, that Ukrainian um, budget uh, is now a lot of it, more than 50% is actually spent centrally, uh, sorry, regionally, is a big advantage. And finally, I don't know how, how much time I have, one or two, maybe minutes, because you said what has not been achieved. And what has not been achieved, I think, in a broader sense, is, is basically the fact that the old system is still fighting, like I said at the beginning, and the fact that um, anti-corruption reform has stalled or the, these forces are trying to stall this reform, it means that Ukraine's justice sector and, and rule of law is, um, is one of the areas where we don't have all the answers how to go about it. You know, there is an excellent judicial roadmap that I'm sure Ambassador uh, will talk about, uh, about, you know, it gives all the wish list of what we want Ukraine to achieve, uh, including administrative justice, independent of anti-corruption court, but how do we, we go about doing it? I think this is the, the stage um, of time where we have to think about it because it's not linear, it's not easy. Uh, and uh, what could be the contribution of the West to this? What is the role of Ukrainian civil society, Ukrainian private sector? 
Th this is what we need to answer. This is the next big uh, homework for Ukraine. Um, thank you very much, uh, Aurelia. I'm certainly going to come back to you later on with some other points to pick, pick up on what you've just said. Um, but now I'd like to turn to um, Oleksii and look at a bit at the situation in the Donbass. I mean, the Donbass is pretty much a big wound um, in Ukraine. I mean, the war goes on. Ukrainian soldiers continue to die despite the ceasefire. Um, so how do you assess the situation um, in Donbass these days? Uh, and perhaps, you know, against the background of the fact that it's been, you know, one year since this, you know, famous uh, summit um, in Paris. I mean, was anything really achieved uh, in the last year following that, that summit? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I would like also to say that I am also research director of Democratic Initiatives Foundation, and we have a lot of polls and focus groups, including the tone bus. Uh, Amanda, because you asked me to talk in general also about security, let me start maybe with some broad security issues. And by that, I mean uh, the changing role of uh, uh, the fact of civil society in Ukraine, which is very important, and it's important to stress that uh, the level of trust to state institutions is low, is low, unfortunately, traditionally, but uh, there is a trust towards civil society organizations, volunteers, the army, the National, uh, the National Guard, and also security service. Not very high, you know, to security service, but still. So it's important to, uh, to stress when we are talking about uh, social security, social security, uh, when we are talking about security, security issues. <clears throat> now, I would like to share my screen and very briefly, you know, to demonstrate to you that we have increase in all national identification of Ukraine, being citizen of Ukraine, and being a regional, having regional identity is decreasing. So this is very important because at the end of 2013, they were very, very close. And now there is a clear preference to be considered as primary identity, to be a citizen only of Ukraine. And you have it in every, uh, in every uh, in every region of Ukraine. Now you have dramatic changes in geopolitical orientations. Okay, so again, 2013 almost equal uh, part of Ukrainians being in favor of the EU, and red line being in favor of the customs union with Russia. And now it's dramatically collapsed to 10 plus. Uh, Support for NATO, blue line, skyrocketed. So if we have a referendum, the blue line is showing how much would vote for NATO and the red line against NATO. And definitely we are talking about hypothetical referendums, so we need to take into account the potential turnout. And in reality, the figures may be, uh, will be different, but again, there is a, there is a train. Now, let's come back to the Donbass. And talking about geopolitical orientations, I would also to stress when Zelensky was elected, uh, actually most experts said that in principle, Zelensky would continue European integration and it will not be changed. And you know, actually, last year we had a progress on the relations with the EU. We had a progress in relations with uh, Great Britain. So basically, you know, if we are talking uh, European uh, integration of Ukraine, the general line didn't change. However, there are questions regarding Russia and first of all, first of all, the Donbas and. Uh, Zelensky tried to boost, as we know, this communication. He put an accent, not uh, he put an accent on direct communication with Putin. So this is a change from previous uh, administration, and actually he believed that it would be easy, easy to change the situation. Just so, just stop shooting, as he said, stop shooting, and it will be cheap. So he made several important uh, concessions 
to Russia, like adopting uh, by formal signing so-called Steinmeier formula. There were some successes regarding, you know, checkpoints, regarding the bridge in Stanitsa Luganska, regarding withdrawal of withdrawal of mutual withdrawal of troops actually it was criticized within ukraine but nevertheless it could be considered as small successes however if we are talking about the results of the paris summit and what happened after that we do not have substantial progress again there are some spheres where you know there are negotiations on increasing the areas of withdrawal on demining but actually in reality it didn't happen you know that there was a lot of talk about ceasefire in the donbass and yes you know the number of shootings decreased dramatically but it's still in place and just uh, you know yesterday another ukrainian soldier was killed by a sniper fire so we need to understand that putin would stop uh, Putin doesn't need a ceasefire per se. He would like to exhaust Ukraine. And he would like also only to trade ceasefire for political concessions from Ukraine, which means a so-called special status to, uh, to temporarily occupied uh, territories. And if we are talking about it in Ukraine, we call it red lines because most people, they do not want to make these concessions to Russia. Also, it's written in uh, in uh, the Minsk agreements, but 62%. You see my screen, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. blue, yeah. In blue, 62%. They would like to see the occupied territories to come back to Ukraine under the same conditions as it was before 2014. Well, maybe it's not very realistic, but it shows uh, the reactions from the population. If we are talking about compromises uh, with Russia regarding the war in the Donbass, so in red, you see those who are against certain compromises. For example, again, special status, 53% against. Full amnesty, 63% against. Uh, local elections in the present situation, which means Russia is exerting its control, still exerting its control over the occupied territory, 66%, and so on. Is there is potential for a compromise? Yes, because, for example, uh, full amnesty is not accepted for Ukrainians, but we may talk about partial amnesty and society would support it. So basically, we understand in Ukraine that the Minsk agreements, uh, they, uh, they were not favorable for Ukraine, especially regarding political concessions, but we can move forward if there is a will from another side, you know, to stop violence, to stop shooting. And in reality, we don't see them. So basically, the paradox is that what is happening right now is that in this situation, Zelensky is coming back to some sort of the policy which Poroshenko adopted, because Poroshenko also tried compromises at the beginning. Okay, so the, again, Zelensky made concessions to Russia, but there's no adequate reaction from the other side, so he needs to take some tough measures. And these tough measures include the recent closure of uh, pro-Russian channels, so-called Medvedchuk uh, channels. Uh, let me... Mm, okay, let me... Okay, so here you see the, in green, you see that support for this decision, you know, to 49% increase within five days. Definitely it's not supported by part of the society. This is also important to be taken into, into account. So there is a division line within Ukrainian society. But what is interesting, so if we reformulate the question, so do you think that Ukraine could use sanctions if uh, activity of uh, some activity is against the interest of states? This of Ukrainian state, and you see dramatic increase. Green, green is dramatic increase. 
if we are fighting terrorist activity, you know even more. And you have this support in all the regions of Ukraine, from the west to, to the east. So it means that the recent decision definitely it is criticized by uh, it is criticized by Russia. It is criticized by pro-Russian opposition in Ukraine. But I think it will be criticized by some uh, organizations like international journalist organizations, maybe Amnesty International, some other uh, organizations. But I think this is inevitable because we have war. And actually, Zelensky finally did what Poroshenko didn't. So we may analyze why Poroshenko didn't do that. So I think Zelensky put, uh, decided to take a very uh, important decision. And the question is, to what extent he would continue this line, you know, becoming more tougher in negotiation with Russia. And there are dangers. And one of the dangers, uh, I would remind you that on March uh, 11 last year, uh, the head of uh, chief of staff of presidential staff, Mr. Yermak, signed an agreement with so-called plenipotentiary representatives of the occupied areas. And this was never used by uh, Ukrainian, uh, uh, Ukrainian diplomacy before. So there were huge protests in Ukraine and finally it was said, no, it's a red line and it was reviewed, the decision was canceled. So we need to see how Zelensky would pursue this line and definitely a lot would depend also on domestic situation with, within Ukraine because now he's Support for the, uh, Zelensky is going down, this is clear, and this is used both by pro-Russian opposition on the one hand, and also let's call it patriotic opposition on the other hand. So the recent move of Zelensky actually give him possibility to boost his rating again. I will stop here. Okay, thank you very much, Alexei. I think this was very interesting insights, not just on Donbass, but I mean much, much more than that. And I would have some quest another question for you, but coming back later, um, because I want to turn now to, to, Ver to Veronica. We're going to move from security to uh, the economy. Um, and Ver Veronica, perhaps you could um, tell us what do you consider to be the most significant economic achievements? you know, of the last few years. I mean, obviously, you know, I would say opening of IKEA in Ukraine is something that many people thought would never happen. Um, so that can be a sort of minor um, achievement. And um, obviously the, the impact of COVID-19, I mean, Ukraine is still has quite a serious situation with, with COVID as far as I'm aware. Um, what is the impact, impact of this? And how do you think it's likely to impact on the, on the, macro, the macro stability of, of the country? Oh, thank you, Amanda. Thank you very much. Thank you for everybody who is uh, participating in this event. I see we have 90 participants. I'm really happy that so many people are interested in Ukraine developments. And uh, I will start with what was achieved in general and then go to COVID 2020 and maybe macro stability perspective. Uh, first, I want to say that some of the reforms that I wanted to mention are already explained in details. So uh, I have more time for other issues, but yes, actually my top list also included banking as a first one and energy for the second. And uh, other things that I think very important are public procurement reform that actually made the whole system very transparent and quite accountable and allowed saving a lot of budget money and also increased trust in the system. Inflation targeting, uh, it's the other part of the reform in the NBU and that increased the trust in the whole system. And we saw that very clearly in 2020 because despite COVID, despite crisis, that was the first time that we saw no uh, like bank runs we saw the stable and sound banking system throughout the whole process. We saw inflation that was actually only 5% on the down one trend, despite all the hardship. And the previous years of reforms is what allowed achieve this uh, stability basically and some 
predictability in the turmoil of the global crisis. Also, I, uh, what was important done was deregulation. There's a lot of licensing removed, a lot of permissions removed, and also a lot of things moved online that uh, allowed fighting corruption, not from the point of view of like penalizing people who were involved in corrupt deeds, but just narrowing the opportunities for corruption. This is actually should be sustainable. It should give maybe not as like publicly visible crowd to say uh, changes, but this is a small but persistent changes that should allow the country to become less corrupt, uh, sustainable, less corrupt in the future. Uh, and also, yeah, I fully agree with the energy. There's a lot of the regulation that completely changed the whole market there, especially in gas and also stimulated energy efficiency. Yes, Ukraine is still very energy inefficient, but if we look at the uh, speed of changes, if we look at the long-term trend, Ukraine is probably one of the uh, fast energy efficiency increasing country, at least in Europe. We started in a very bad end, but we are changing. And that is also very, very important for uh, long-term stability and also for Ukrainian aspirations in terms of the climate neutrality, Green Deal, and all other changes that exist. Uh, what we have in 2020? Indeed, the economy was hit hard. The, the expected GDP decline is between 43 and 4.6%. We still don't have all final figures, but the range is pretty clear. But as I said, the economy developed much more resilient than we expected at the beginning of the crisis. My institute is forecasting the, gal the drop between uh, 6 and 11 percent. Uh, and uh, where we got it wrong? Definitely part of that was uh, these lockdowns. We expected that the government will keep strong lockdowns. It appeared they didn't. Uh, Ukraine basically opted for quite mild and not so strongly enforced policy of lockdowns in order to support the economy. Uh, but also there are two other factors. One is the, the resilience of household consumption that was supported by still growing the real wages, uh, by uh, increased uh, social payments, not like uh, money from the sky in the uncontrolled amount because we just don't have such money, but still there are some increased pension indexation, some additional payments, uh, some payments to uh, people with children who are private entrepreneurs. So there was some support. Uh, plus remittances. Despite all the closures of borders, we have continued labor migration and people continue to send back remittances at the quite large extent. Plus trade. Um, the message is uh, that Ukraine uh, found other huge market exports to China doubled last year. We export in there very few products, mostly commodities, but it grew like crazy, supporting the overall performance of the country. There's EU is still the largest partner and it will be the largest partner. And what is important in EU, Ukraine exports much wider range of commodities. So it's uh, EU is uh, the market for everybody. China is an opportunity for selected producers, but it's very good for macroeconomic stability. What is the most uh, difficult part in the Ukrainian economy was the fiscal situation, because uh, the government, as everybody, tried to have a fiscal stimulus, but we had uh, two issues. One is the efficiency of spending, other is the finding, financing of the deficit. Efficiency, the, the biggest problem was with a so-called COVID fund, the fund established to fight the COVID, and we had huge debates on one hand, whether it was correctly used because it was created to support, uh, first of all, healthcare system and some social payments, but eventually 
uh, almost a half of the fund, uh, not exactly half, but uh, one third, between one third and half was designated to construction of roads in the summer, uh, which uh, was hugely criticized in the autumn that we had a huge spike and not sufficiently equipped hospitals, etc. On the other hand, the past procedures for purchases in the fund raised questions about its efficiency, where the money were spent correctly. But other one was actually the funding, the ability to attract money for the funding of the deficit, because Ukraine relies on the international support, on international donors, and IMF role is definitely huge here. Here, we had a problem that uh, Ukraine uh, derailed, de facto derailed program with IMF almost immediately after it was signed in June 2020. We got the first trench. Then we had a huge scandal at the NBU because they uh, then had Yakov Smali resigned, claiming political pressures. It took some time to somehow calm down the situation and to show that uh, despite some frictions, basically, the NBU continues to conduct uh, sound monetary policy, continues to supervise banks. With, so, so far, so good. But then we had crisis in judiciary system, the huge crisis in the constitutional court, the very active attempt to ruin the whole anti-corruption structures, and uh, every and. The, all these judiciary anti-corruption those has not been resolved yet completely. There are some attempts to roll backs, but uh, to say that we are, we are on track would be uh, too optimistic. So basically we have now online mission of IMF. Uh, it's not clear. Is it still ongoing or is it like paused till the end? It's not officially closed, but it's not, it's like, <laughs> moving very slowly till on March, uh, then we will see the last problem with the intervention of the government into tariff setting, not government, basically the president first, into tariff setting on gas market and the temporary cap on the tariffs. Now, after that, it will be somehow solved, the communication will resume. But we have now situation that we have the unclear prospect of the funding of the budget deficit expected to be still large also in 2021. And that makes the question how long the stability, macro stability will last. Reforms did a lot to ensure that Ukraine managed to go through this uh, really very hard, cri uh, hard crisis. Uh, this quite good, not ideal situation, but quite good uh, indicators with uh, quite good performance, with growth, uh, or at least recovery starting already in the third quarter, but then we need, we need reforms and we need clarity. And uh, here the stumbling block basically is not the economy per se. We can discuss peculiarities of economic reforms, so we will see how land market will work, etc., etc. It's a lot of things that change and are changing. But we have one fundamental issue is the judiciary, uh, unreformed, uh, striking back basically quite painfully for the whole society. And before this stumbling block will be resolved, the economic growth in Ukraine will remain on the trajectory of about three, four percent on average, with a completely insufficient to catch up with neighbors and with Ukrainian aspirations, with uh, any like reasonable projections. But for that, we need to change uh, that in order to get investment, both foreign and domestic. That's my message. Thank you, Veronica. I think this the end, this, the message at the end was very clear. Uh, and exactly the right one about the judicial reform, but I think we can come back to that as well in a bit later. You know, I now want to give the um, floor to Ambassador Masikas. Uh, welcome to you here, Ambassador. Very pleased to see you. Um, I think you're still in still in Brussels, right? You were there for the association 
um, Council. Um, so it'd be great to hear from you, obviously, you know, what do you think have been the major, not just the major achievements, but I mean, where is Ukraine, you know, significantly lagging behind or not doing enough? Um, and what would the EU really like to see from Ukraine, you know, immediately, you know, that they've had enough of waiting for it, they want to see action on this now. Thank you very much, uh, Amanda. Uh, very good to see old and new friends. Uh, as diplomats go, uh, uh, um, I will start by agreeing with everything that, uh, that was said before. Um, maybe indeed the biggest achievement, uh, as uh, Soresia Lucevic um, pointed out, is that Ukraine has remained a remarkably pluralistic democratic society. And you could actually see the proof of that in some of the slides that uh, uh, Oleksiy Haran um, uh, laid out. Uh, whereas, whereas the majority of the population, of course, supports uh, ending the war uh, in, in Donbas. Uh, if it goes to a concrete, uh, not proposals, but concrete options or possibilities, how to do that, then all those concrete options are actually rejected by the, by the, public, by the public opinion. And that shows you also something about, about the, the uh, pluralism of the, of the opinion in the, in the society. Not, not only banking um, stability, but an overall macro financial stability has been achieved and that's a, is a huge achievement since since uh, 20, 2014. Um, mm, even in the horrible year of 2020, Ukraine's economy contracted only by 4%, uh, much less than was expected, and a, and a recovery is underway. And the cooperation with international financial institutions has been, has been maintained. Um, this is this is all good news. Well, since uh, since 2014, um, the Ukrainian uh, leaders and the Ukrainian society obviously has been has been um, building a better country and building a better country uh, according to the Euro Atlantic model, uh, inscribing this goal. Uh, of Euro-Atlantic integration into the constitution, the biggest sort of um, the biggest uh, commitment one can make uh, as a uh, as a state. So we are what we are facing these days in Ukraine is the biggest geopolitical shift in Europe of our days, and of course that's why it is so fiercely opposed by some not least uh, by, a, by a neighboring country. Um, the EU has, with its association agreement, provided a blueprint for this shift, a blueprint for the reforms uh, in Ukraine. And it was, it was uh, once again reconfirmed yesterday at the, at the association council uh, between the EU and Ukraine and at Prime Minister uh, Denis Shmuhal's uh, several meetings with uh, uh, with the European uh, with the with the with the EU leaders. Uh, concrete uh, concrete working paths on the digital market, on raw materials, on uh, on the reviews of uh, the association agreements achievements. Not itself opening the agreement, but but a, but a common review of how what has worked and what could work better, and especially in in particular in the field of trade or the in the in the trade agreement where integration uh, can be can be further uh, further deepened uh, or, or strengthened. The fight against corruption was one of the Maidan's or the uh, revolution of dignity's promises, if not the main promise. Yes. Um, in 2013, 2014, the Ukrainian society just proved that it has emancipated uh, enough to, to get rid 
to refuse to live under a crooked, corrupt regime. So everything corruption related or fight against corruption related remains extremely important. And the new uh, institutional architecture has started working, of course, not as quickly as people would want people, and it's humanely, I understand, people want to be, uh, want to see big fish being jailed. But those institutions need to have the time and independence to work, to work uh, properly. Um, in the fall of 2020, or in, in the summer 2020, it seemed though that for the reforms and for Zel President Zelensky's team, uh, was in sort of a um, situation like like you sometimes have in theater, where the premiere uh, goes very well with enthusiasm and everything, and then for the second act you need to you need to gather yourself once more. It's all already a routine, and it's all it's it's it's, it's um, uh, harder to find a new motivation. But then this major blow by the Constitutional Court of Ukraine mm, hit in. And, and not, only, uh, not only Zelensky and his team, but the whole political elite understood that, that uh, each and every reform, each and every re uh, achievement can be overturned, sometimes on a dubious grounds, very easily. So, and, and that mobilized the leadership again, and that again turned the focus on, on what, uh, what High Representative Joseph Borrell yesterday at the press conference called the mother of all reforms, namely the judicial reform. Uh, it's not only, it not only sets the checks and balances in society and provides for trust mm, of the citizens. Uh, but it's also uh, become uh, the judicial system, unreliability of the ju judicial system has become the number one obstacle for, for an invest, uh, investment in, in general, including, including uh, foreign. So the justice reform has become, I mean, constitutional courts uh, decisions were a clear challenge to Zelensky and to the, to the pro-reform um, political elite and it, it is about staying staying the course all there's something that has not been done in ukraine for 30 years the whole whole time of their independence all international partners are, are helping are offering the help you amada you refer to the uh, g7 uh, G7 roadmap, the massive EU's assistance and, and advice uh, the United States are, are advising. Uh, and to end with, the clear advice is not to try some piecemeal solutions here and there, start to, you know, start to fine tune the constitutional court uh, by, by filling some vacancies um, not to not not to try not to try one institution here and the other one there, but but to go for a sweeping comprehensive judicial reform at the center of which should be the reform of the High Council of Justice, the body to administrate the courts, the body to nominate the judges, which is completely unreformed. If the High Council of Justice can be reformed and the High Qualification Commission for Judges and the Ethics Committee with transparent procedures could be established. That will be the most important thing to do. That would be the litmus test, not only for the judicial reform, but for the reform course in general. Thank you. Thank you, um, Marty. Maybe I can just, you know, have a small add on point. Um, sometimes there's talk of EU fatigue towards Ukraine. Um, do you feel there's any such fatigue, or do you feel that the EU as a whole continues to, to stand, you know, shoulder to shoulder without question with Ukraine? We always have questions. 
and one must always have questions. That is, that is clear. Um, in political terms, it's the political capital of the EU democratic leaders that is being used uh, in this relationship. And uh, in terms of assistance, it's the EU's taxpayers' money that has been that has been spent uh, 16 billion since uh, 20, 2014. Mm, so uh, we we always have questions. I think it's it's proper to quote uh, the uh, previous Commission President Jean Claude Juncker, who, who who put it very simply: the more the more Ukraine reforms, the more we we support, and and that that stays that uh, stays true today as well. Uh, Orisa Lutsevich uh, brought uh, the example of the decentralization reform, something that, that the EU has uh, supported and is supporting with, with almost 150 million euros and which is uh, um, a, big, big, a big success. Of course, if one looks at the, uh, at the region, if one looks at the Eastern partnership countries, then one one finds the the uh, now a bit silenter but still the revolution in uh, in Belarus uh, uh, in last autumn a full uh, all out war between uh, or uh, uh, around Nagorno Karabakh and so on uh, the Ukraine is uh, is so big and Ukraine's uh, uh, determination is is so clear uh, but yes uh, the EU stands with the EU stands with Ukraine both politically. Of course, we, I haven't talked about the about the Russian aggression, uh, about ending the conflict and territorial integrity. Uh, the EU is responding to the recent Ukrainian uh, initiative of the Crimean platform. Uh, quite rightly uh, aimed at raising the price the political and diplomatic price for the uh, for the legal annexation of Crimea. Because, uh, uh, you could see, you could have seen uh, in recent years that whereas whereas on on the conflict in Donbas you you still have a a process or a framework, then the Crimean issue uh, got less and less international attention, and, and that's a, that's a welcome and uh, quite justified. Uh, initiative by by Ukraine the, the platform. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, I'm going to put another question to each um, panelist, and then we'll come to some of the audience questions. I'd like to encourage the audience to you know put their questions across because I can see there's not that many, um, and I think there should be many more. So please get typing. Um, so, uh, uh, Arisia, I'd like to come back to this topic of Russian um, propaganda in the information space. I mean, it was just mentioned about the three um, media outlets that were closed down um, by uh, President uh, Zelensky, but I'm guessing this is just the, you know, the tip of the iceberg. Um, what do you think could be done more um, to, you know, to rid Ukraine of this real security threat? Thank you, Amanda. And I think it's, it's a very important question because uh, as I was, I started talking about the importance of democracy, as much the uh, information space is important for a democratic society to be able to judge policy, right? Because that is the famous phrase, we may, maybe we not, we not all can make policy, but we can judge policy. And if you have such a toxic information space, uh, like in Ukraine, that is a mixture of uh, TV channels and media uh, and online outlets owned by uh, different big financial interest groups, the way we call them, or vested interest, because I think the, the oligarchy where you would see an immediate capture of power is not necessarily the case in Ukraine. They are exercising power by proxy. And here, Russian proxy power is exercised through media and Ukrainian groups who are against some of these uh, reforms that will create more level playing field uh, will um, want to exercise this power. So, you know, I think there is a new momentum with this decision to uh, limit the supply of this information and limit the supply of 
um, news. It's not even a news. It's it's very often you know really comes from the uh, Kremlin propaganda playbook. Uh, the messages that are really discredited the nature of the office of the president, regardless who is the president, the uh, whole democratic institutions and Ukraine as a viable viable state. Uh, and I think Zelensky, by doing this, I would like to again bring the international dimension, the US, new, the new US administration and Biden, because clearly uh, the, the three most important decisions that Zelensky took to open up a new chapter in Ukraine-US relations was uh, sanctioning uh, uh, those individuals who were put uh, for uh, their pro-Russian disinformation of Biden on the sanction list like Dubinsky and excluding him from the party fraction. It's also sanctioning Chinese investors that were trying to acquire Motor Siege. Uh, finally, that decision uh, came to bear. And finally, what we spoke about these three TV channels. So all of this means that Ukraine wants to really uh, have a serious strategic relationship with the United States, supporting um, the vision that this information, misinformation, uh, uh, the weaponization of information is dangerous. And uh, Biden, President Biden was very clear uh, in his uh, kind of first fo close foreign policy discussion at the State Department that Russia will be held accountable. And for uh, that to happen, it's not just United States, the European Union and other international partners who have to play a role. It's countries like Ukraine who has to get their house in order and clean up. And, and here I, I would like to, you know, maybe link it back to corruption because I found this quote quite striking and listen to this, what, what now President Biden said when he was the vice president in 2017, he said, Russia over the last decade has used another foreign policy weapon. It uses corruption as a tool of coercion to keep Ukraine vulnerable and dependent. So pursue those reforms, he said to Ukrainians in Kyiv, to root out corruption. It's not just about good governance. It's about self-preservation. It's about your very national security. So you can imagine what kind of conversation President Biden will have with President Zelensky when it happens. And I think that um, there could be uh, quite a good uh, array of cooperation between Ukraine and United States and for the same matter European Union that is now pushing its own Defense of Democracy Act, where it's really now defining what is this information, because do we really know what it means in legal terms? Do we have uh, a clear definition uh, of it? No, we don't. We are operating on a very slippery ground. Um, and here, I think what offers an, another opportunity uh, on this info warfare ground is NATO enhanced opportunity partnership that Ukraine has and its cooperation within NATO and broader security framework to strengthen Ukraine's own resilience, because the, I, from what I know, the next NATO summit will be about resilience, it is trying to uh, understand, you know, how to protect democracies how to protect societies from um, this information. And if I may just offer one avenue where I think we all should be doing more, Ukraine, US, EU, is actually working on the demand side of this information. Because it's always a good question to ask why our community citizens are drawn to these information sources. Why do they remain in these bubbles? And it's probably because they feel comfortable there because it touches on their grievances, something they are dissatisfied in the societies, something that would probably need a serious um, avenue to bring different views together to discuss and find compromises rather than staying in these comfortable information bubbles. And it's of course education of young children, adults, how to have a good information hygiene, you know, how to distinguish different sources of information. Uh, and I think that um, actually European Union and US is helping a lot Ukraine to um, introduce some of these um, courses. And I know that the Ministry of Culture, uh, there's the deputy minister who is in charge of um, unrolling such program uh, in different schools. So this, I, I would just want to highlight to you there as an answer to your question. 
Great, thank you very much, um, Aurisia. Now I'd like to turn back to you, um, Alexei, um, again on security related issues. I mean, we already mentioned a bit the Donbass, but I would like to bring us to um, um, to Crimea, which is um, just an equally as equally important. You have this new initiative, Crimea Platform. Um, do you think this is going to bring any fruit? Hello. Alexei, are you there? Yes, yes, I'm, I'm here. I was too disciplined, you know, to switch off uh, my voice. So, uh, okay, uh, thank you very much. Actually, Amanda, I think the answer to your question is not in Kiev. It's actually in the West, and in the Western capitals and our international partners. So the question is because definitely what Ukraine is proposed to uh, to have Crimea uh, on the radar screen, not to forget about it, to increase monitoring of the human rights, uh, not only Crimean Tatars, but also Ukrainians. So it's very, very important, but I think uh, we cannot do a lot here without support of our international partners. And if I may, I would draw the example when uh, Ukrainian sailors were attacked by Russian battle, but Russian ships in uh, in Kerch Strait. Okay, and what were the sanctions from the West? Several people, you know, they were called to sanctions, but basically, the, you know, it was a huge accident, huge violation of international law, international sea law. But the reaction was quite. Uh, uh, quite mild. Having said that, I am appreciating and I am uh, the Western, the Western support to Ukraine, and I believe that uh, EU is standing with us and the United States against aggression of Ukraine. But some steps could be much more, much more tougher. So a lot. So again, I think the idea of Crimean platform is uh, is is very important. Uh, again, uh, there should be more support, more support to uh, Crimean Tatars, to other people in Crimea. Again, monitoring from different human rights organizations, resolutions in support of those whose rights are violated in Crimea. Um, again, but here we need to be realists, okay? So we understand that there would be no immediate fruits. Uh, I would like, because you asked about Crimea, and I would like again to say here about the approach of Ukrainians toward occupied Donbass, parts of Donbass and Crimea, uh, Ukrainians are not bloodthirsty. It means that we are not only rejecting some so-called compromises which are supposed, which are offered by the other side, by Russia. Uh, as, I, as I said, Ukrainians are against full amnesty, but we are in favor of partial amnesty. Ukrainians do not view people in the occupied territories, both Donbass and Crimea, as traitors. We see them as the hostages uh, of the situation. And uh, now there is a law on transition for the deoccupied territories. So the very term collaborators is excluded. So, you know, we are trying to find more, uh, more mild, you know, more mild solution, solution to that. So, yeah, that would be my answer to that. There were some questions actually I wanted to react. Can I? Some questions by yeah. Anybody? If you can just if you can just wait a couple of minutes because okay. I, you yeah. mean if you can just wait a couple of minutes because I just want to put two more questions and then we'll go to the audience questions. So you have to have some patience, Alexia. Okay, Thank okay. I'm, I'm very. Um, I just wanted to come back to you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I just want to come back to you, Veronica. Um, a second. Um, just to come back to the, the economy of of Ukraine. Um, to ask you about the development of new sectors in the country. I mean, for example, the high tech sector, I mean, which isn't a sector which isn't, as far as I know, um, yet dominated by oligarchs, because I mean, the traditional sectors, agriculture and steel still remain very much dominated. How important is it to, you know, progress with these new sectors and how are they going? 
Okay, thank you. The question is very important. And there is a question of what to define as a high tech. If we think about uh, IT, that is uh, information technology, uh, it, it's developing, it's uh, showing quite good resilience to the shock and continues growing. And uh, actually it's a great sector because it's very uh, like dispersed. It's not dominated by any oligarch, but actually anybody. It's uh, as competitive as we can imagine and oriented outwards primarily. So it's doing good. Also the issue of uh, protection of property rights and protection of intellectual property rights remains one of the key issues for the development of the sector, especially bringing value added of this sector to the country. Because, for example, uh, there is a very, I don't know, famous, but at least it's, it's known program and app Grammarly that helps uh, uh, everybody to clean their English text. It's developed by Ukrainians, but it's not registered in Ukraine. It, it, the headquarters are not in Ukraine. Exact one reason I suspect why is this intellectual property rights. Also, it's also the whole, whole environment. So this part is good. We also have development actually in more high tech in terms of uh, technology, a part of traditional like big aircraft or space that Ukraine inherited and tries with mixed uh, success develop. Ukraine has been recently producing some small airplanes. I was surprised to learn that uh, drones or actually in medicine, due to the war, due to these developments, which are very sad, but we have some boosts in uh, some uh, quite technological sectors because we have to find solutions for treatment of uh, people uh, for doing some spine or something like that. So there, are, there is a boost and there is a proposal. We don't see that on the macro level, but that's developed. So, we have that, but to see that uh, like a big, big chunk, we return to the issue of property rights and judiciary. Otherwise, uh, you will see Ukrainians being in hackathons in NASA, they're using some very crazy solutions for uh, space uh, fueling that I cannot really repeat. But I'm not sure, but where it will be registered and where the value added will stay is a huge question. Great, thank you. Um, now I'm going to start to take some of these questions from the audience because I see that one of the questions here is very relevant, first of all, to, um, to you, uh, Ambassador. Uh, so I'll take that one first. Who is from Pat Cox, I believe, the former president um, of the European Parliament, and he's he's referring to the recent EP um, re resolution adopted on Ukraine. Um, which emphasizes a return to the future of conditionality in respect for EU funding. Um, and he's asking what specific key conditions will the EU propose and with what milestones? Um, and secondly, what are the next steps foreseen in deepening EU-Ukraine relations? And what perspective is the EU willing to offer Ukraine? Um, so I think I'll give those, you, see those to you specifically. He also has a third question, which I think is for everybody on the panel. Um, asking the panel to evaluate Ukrainian attitudes to the geopolitics of accessing COVID vaccines. So, floor is yours, first of all, Ambassador. Thank you very much. Uh, very pertinent questions, um, indeed. All EU assistance is conditioned. Uh, there are there are specific. And there are specific frameworks, uh, specific conditions for for all the, for all the uh, cooperation and that uh, that we are that we are doing. Mm, and uh, I must admit that um, one of the main challenges here is to ensuring continuity. Decentralization is a is a good example where the EU, EU had almost 150 million program in, in place. Uh, 
and uh, uh, where the continuity has been has been maintained quite well with the with the change of president, change of the government. Public sector reform, another uh, 100 plus million euro um, reform you know, pr program, is where where we have been experiencing a certain a certain uh, decrease of the of the uh, commitment uh, or or it's more fair to say uh, focus there uh, if one speaks of conditionality at the center of the public administration reform stands the the merit based competitions for public sector uh, positions and this uh, these competitions were were stopped or paused when when ukraine introduced the current act and we have been insisting and we are insisting that these competitions must be restored and last week uh, the the law restoring them passed uh, the first reading in the Verkhovna Rada, and we are doing our utmost to, to restore that there. To, to give you one concrete example, um, another one. Ukraine wants to synchronize their electricity grids with the, with the European ones. And there's a very clear roadmap of things what, what need to be done on the Ukrainian side in order to, in order this to become technically, but yes, also politically feasible, like starting with the really independent uh, energy regulator. So it's not only about the volume of the connections. It is, it is actually setting up a real uh, European model electricity market, and then uh, the the perspective of synchronization can become can become uh, concrete. Um, of the of the, the, the there was the question of the of the next perspectives. I think uh, uh, I think the the review process of the achievements of the of the association agreement is is the process to watch for for the for the next year. Because, uh, because uh, the, the agreement is the basis, is the framework, and it, it is a very deep one uh, uh, of our relations. So anything, everything that can be done in order to make that, uh, to tap fully the potential and to make that agreement work, work even better uh, will, have, uh, will have huge positive consequences. Um, secondly, uh, when the pandemic hit, uh, the EU invited Ukraine to, to uh, become an observer member of the EU's health policy committee, a, an offer that Ukrainians have, have used uh, pretty enthusiastically. And that's another con uh, concrete example where, uh, where people, Ukrainians and the EU officials are working together, seeing each other uh seeing each other and then get better used uh, to each other so that's a that's a very not only practical but also a humane factor thank you amanda if i may jump in on the question of pat cox about the geopolitics of the yes, time because i i've, I've um... I have the latest polling on the attitudes of Ukrainians to different vaccines and trust. And actually it reflects pretty well the Ukrainian geopolitical map. You have the majority of Ukrainians trusting vaccine produced in US, uh, UK and Belgium. And then you have trust to Russian vaccine about 12% and trust to Chinese vaccine 6%. So you, you can see where Ukrainian hearts and the uh, uh, understanding of the quality of the product is. Uh, it's actually very important what Ambassador said about delivering on these partnerships and expectations through engaging Ukrainians, either in this public health committee, because it's always, you know, the Eurosceptics and anti-European forces always use the same mantra, but, you know, you may want them, but what it is they're giving you? And, you know, you can say it's a legitimate question, and I think there is a good answer 
to that question. The problem is, you know, strategically messaging that answer and making sure why the Ukrainian audience knows what it is in these concrete terms Ukraine is, is getting. And, and I think that um, vaccine in COVID is used as another a narrative in the disinformation war. We see it actually Russia doing it, China doing it, uh, and it's a public health issue and it's so important so important for uh, for uh, you know ukraine and european union because ukraine is one of the largest neighbors of the european union right here with the strong exchange of people there's a lot of exchanges going on cross marriages families people doing circular labor migration so i think it's important that both sides understand the benefits of uh, uh, you know uh, uh, effective vaccination program it will only make two sides stronger Thanks, um, Orisia. I'm going to put the, this next question to you, um, Oleksiy. It's from Dimitro Shurko um, of um, Uniform News Agency. And he's he's asking about the visit of Borrell and the humiliating, um, what he calls the humiliate, humiliating behavior of Foreign Minister Lavrov. Um, he thinks it makes it clear Russia has no intention of political will to respect neither EU nor Ukraine's interests. Um, so he has two questions. What could be the way to prevent Ukraine from becoming a sanitary grey barrier between Europe and Russia? Um, and secondly, can we expect, after all, the wise approach of all democratic forces in Ukraine to unite themselves in a face of the growing Russian threat, not cheating and disgracing themselves in front of each other? Oleksiy, are you there? You seem to have disappeared again. No, I'm here. Well, the final part okay, is the most. Good. The final part is the most interesting, definitely. Regarding Borrell's visit and what Russians did there is uh, actually we Ukrainians we are uh, we are very we are very realistic about what to expect, or better to say, not to expect from Russia. Okay, and EU is uh, is trying to be engaged in this policy of dialogue, dialogue. Okay, and we see what is the Russian reaction. So most Ukrainian experts think that uh, with Russia it's necessary to have only a firm position, and this would be the best way to have Russia uh, to have Russia. Uh, to, to negotiate with Russia and to make some concessions from Russia, not to demonstrate its own, uh, its own weakness. What is to be done uh, to prevent Ukraine from being a part of gray zone? Well, I think association agreement and deepening of the association agreement. So that's, that's the best way. So we need just to implement it. And regarding uh, regarding Democrats, well, this is the most tricky <laughs> tricky issue. If you ask me, do I believe in the unification of Democrats at this point? Uh, my answer would be negative because the main force they would like uh, in this camp, they would like to see only one person around whom we can unite. I mean, former President Poroshenko. And we know that many people, even in patriotic opposition, they do not accept Poroshenko, though, frankly speaking, his ratings are increasing now, and uh, in the hypothetical runoff with Zelensky, they would be quite close these days. Uh, the rating of Poroshenko's European solidarity is also, is also increasing, but again, it's difficult for me to imagine how uh, Poroshenko would unite with Timoshenko uh, or even with Golas, with Svoboda and other forces. Having said that, I would like to remind you about two very important periods, uh, two very important yes, periods in Ukrainian history when Ukrainians united. This is the Orange Revolution of 2004 and this is Euromaidan, you know, Ukrainians united despite all the all the contradictions. So uh, there are good examples to that. And uh, under present situation, again, we may see that sometimes, you know, there is, uh, there is a unification around state in national interests, 
with people from Zelensky party as well. We may, we may talk about uh, law on land reform, which was supported by European solidarity and uh, goalless. We may talk about law on reforming of security service of Ukraine, which was supported by Poroshenko. Uh, when, when Zelensky tried to uh, well, undermine, the, uh, to dissolve the constitutional court. And what is interesting, the public opinion would applaud it because of populism. But there was a counter draft law supported not only by patriotic opposition, Poroshenko, Timoshenko, Golas, but also from a bulk of Zelensky party, including speaker, vice speaker, and many other prominent speakers from uh, Sluga Narodu, from servant of the people. So I think that, again, it's difficult for me to see this unification in the electoral campaigns, but around certain very important issues, laws on land reform, on changes in the, uh, in the judicial system and some others, there is, it, it's possible. Okay. And maybe I can ask a follow-up question um, to whoever in the panel would like to say it, just, just to come back actually to this issue of Russia um, and the important you know, decisions that the EU needs to take over its over its um, Russian strategy in the future. Um, perhaps it would be for you, for you, uh, Mati. Do you think it's actually possible that the EU can actually come together and have one voice? on Russia and have this new strategy towards Russia, which has been much talked about. And, and how important you know, is, is it that they do that in terms of their you know, Eastern partnership partners? Thank you. Uh, the question falls into my, into my sphere of competence, but I think it's, it's as old or even older than the whole common foreign security policy uh, itself. Um, in 2014, uh, I can talk about that because I, uh, uh, at that time I represented Estonian in the, uh, in the EU in Brussels. Um, in 2014, a um, profound shift uh, took place in EU's relations with Russia. Um, and the and the um, instead of uh, constantly trying to uh, against all the evidence or most of the evidence uh, try to find areas for common uh, for, for for common action and cooperation uh, the EU got much more realistic and the EU made clear there are limits. And it was all triggered by the, by the uh, illegal annexation of Crimea and the aggression against Ukraine in, in Donbass. Uh, but of course, uh, there were still, are uh, where, where still those, um, and this policy was, was then codified in the, uh, in the five guiding principles, and just to just to uh, illustrate the the uh, the profoundness of the shift, if if somebody had told me even ten years ago that the EU puts its policies towards Russia dependent on how, how Russia treats its neighbors, how Russia treats Ukraine. I would not have believed. Now, the guiding principles clearly say that the full implementation of the of the Minsk agreement is the litmus there. So, uh, uh, but um, I think to, to cut the uh, long and not fully my story short, uh, I think after the last after the last uh, week's visit, uh, the, some uh, still remaining questions of the of the uh, possibilities uh, for uh, for meaningful engagement were answered in moscow in front of all of us if i may amanda jump in with a suggestion and I, say, 
I think what is important is to understand that when we are talking about EU policy towards Russia, of course, the top level official policy is important because it provides leadership. But I think there's still much work to be done about societies in the European Union member states understanding the dangers that are coming from Russia. Because, you know, uh, uh, why is the disinformation dangerous? You know, why, uh, why, um, you, why, for example, UK audience should know what Russia did in Crimea and how it, um, how it ran this hybrid operation is because Russia will abuse their own vulnerabilities in their societies. And I was struck recently to read about the uh, charitable foundation to defend the environment that was set up in the uh, federal land of Mecklenburg West Pomerania, exactly the ending point of Nord Stream 2, with the budget of 20 million and 200,000, where 20 million is provided by Hasprom and 200,000 is provided by the budget of the local federal land. And the local officials are defend federal officials are, are defending this decision as illegitimate that Hasprom will actually help preserve environment in the federal land. And you see, these are the tools that Russians are using. So regardless of a top level strategy, I think it's very important also to understand how Russia uses this subversion from the inside of European societies. Thank you, um, Aricia. Um, we have a question here asking about, um, about um, Zelensky, is he, truly independent of his own oligarch connections? Um, and when should Biden invite Zelensky to the White House? Um, who, would like to, who would like to take this question? Um, I, I may, I may Veronica, start. maybe you would like to take? No, I, okay. No, I can, okay. I, I, I may start. <laughs> well, because the answer to the first question, question is very short. No, he is not independent from oligarchs. He is dependent. That's clear, but at the same time, we need to understand that it's not, it's not true to present him only as a puppet of oligarchs or especially as a puppet of Kolomoisky. So again, there is a group of Kolomoisky, of, of MPs from, who, who are affiliated with Kolomoisky within Zelensky faction. He appointed, uh, Zelensky appointed Dubinsky, uh, notorious guy, to be uh, responsible for Kyiv Oblast, for example. So, but at the same time, there are a lot of steps which uh, may demonstrate, which uh, demonstrate that Zelensky is trying to, to distance himself from Kolomoisky. So uh, the constellation of forces is much more uh, complicated. Still, I would say that at this point, um, or at least until recently, oligarchs, they were quite, uh, quite happy with, Kolomo, uh, with Zelensky, I would say. But it may change, and it may change because also Zelensky demonstrate he's, um, he's not effective, his ratings are going down. So who knows? Maybe the so-called oligarchic consensus will be around another candidate. We don't know. Zelensky still has chances, you know, to be re-elected, but, uh, but there are many, many questions. And the basic question for me, whether in this situation Zelensky would, he's not a radical reformer. Well, he had in mind that he would be a radical reformer for the country, but he is not. So, but at least it's necessary to have some steps, you know, towards, and he, he can do that, he can still do that. Uh, regarding uh, invitation to, to the White House, I would say that it's not so important when from symbolic point of view. The main thing is substance. And the main thing, again, is not a visit just, you know, to tick the box. The main sense in real American-Ukrainian partnership. And I think that Biden's election provides good chances for uh, for Ukraine to develop relations with, uh, with the United States as a strategic partner. And by the way, I will... I, Great, I, thank I, you. Again, uh, I'm, 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 excuse me. I am criticizing, you know, uh, 
Zelensky's approach and Zelensky policy regarding Russia, because this policy is concentrated in the hands of one person, his chief of staff, Mr. Yermak. And this is very dangerous because Minister of Foreign Affairs, they are somehow, you know, excluded from this sphere. But if we are talking the EU, uh, UK, United States, I would say that both Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Vice Prime Minister on uh, European and Euro-Atlantic integration, they are players here. And this is, they are doing their work quite professionally. Okay, thank you, Alexei. I want to quickly move to the next question. It's from Andrew Duff, uh, my colleague and also former MEP. And he's asking if the EU establishes a European Security Council, should Ukraine be on it? Um, Aricia, would you like to answer that? It's, it's a hypothetical question, I understand. So maybe Ambassador has more information about the reality on the ground. But if, if such thing happens, you know, in a similar way to the Public Health Council, I think Ukraine should be involved because I think uh, this is about the deepening integration. And of course, if membership right now is not feasible and politically difficult, Ukraine can have, you know, if you want similar to NATO, compatibility without membership, which would already strengthen Ukraine to a big degree. And I think European Union would benefit also from Ukraine's contribution to a security council by simply understanding how Ukraine is fighting the war with Russia. Because believe me, Ukraine is a laboratory to test all kinds of Russian active measures, disinformation, energy blackmail, trade blackmail, uh, elite interconnection and all these vulnerabilities. Uh, things go, I mean, even poisoning, if you recall the poisoning of um, President Yushchenko, where it sta all started, it all started in, in Ukraine. So Ukraine can really be also a contributor to the European security. Thank you, um, Arisia. We just have about one minute. So I'd, I would like to ask all of you to make, you know, a final very quick um, response to the question. If you had a if you had if you had a wish, um, what would be you know the most important thing you would like to see um, you know the Zelensky administration do this year, and also the most important thing from the from the EU and the US? Maybe start with maybe start with you, Veronica, because you didn't speak for a while. Yeah, because it's not about economy for a while, uh, but uh, yeah. <laughs> the, and actually my answer is also not about economy. Uh, actually, my wish is uh, to really start judiciary changes, because actually even fight with corruption, anything is this is the the point, the stumbling block, uh, at least from my point of view. So for Ukraine, for Zelensky. To have us to minute to do that, so there is uh, very concrete recommendations for relaunch of the uh, the qualification commission, the uh, the dissolvement of the Kiev uh, administrative court. There are, there are very clear things that have to be done, and to install in proper competition with international uh, and uh, public and civil society observers and not only observers, but with a say and veto powers for this election in future courts. For you and for us to support these, and maybe also to try to keep Russia far away from Ukrainian politics so that Ukraine can achieve the result. That's my final Great. Um, Orisia? Right, I feel like Christmas, it's Christmas time. Okay, <laughs> well, I think my wish is that all the three sides, if we are talking Ukraine, US, EU, have a real feeling of trust, because especially between Ukraine and US, there was some relationship, but it wasn't necessarily built on a, a feeling of trust. And with the European Union, with Zelensky being still relatively new, there was a lot of not understanding what he is. Uh, and I and I hope I mean uh, this is my wish that this relationship is really built on trust because then it can be a real partnership. And of course, for new U.S. administration, uh, I think 
if possible, the, the cost for Russian further encroachment into Ukraine has to increase. And I think this is something that United States can do. And I hope there will be some good creative thinking uh, together with Kiev and Washington on what it actually means in practical terms. Thank okay. you. So Christmas well, wishes, see. right? If Christmas wishes, right? So uh, I, I will talk about Zelensky I, 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 and his government. I think the main problem of uh, Mr. Zelensky, President Zelensky is his personnel policy. Okay, he's rely, he is not relying on real professionals, on experts from civil society, from uh, think tanks who are giving him professional advices. But instead, he continues to play the old games in his personnel policy. And specifically, you know, he was asked whom he trusts. And he's answering, I am trusting Mr. Yermak. He is also trusting Mr. Shafir. He is a dead. Uh, well, maybe good people, but not all. So, and I think it's very important for Zelensky to have different sources of uh, information and channels of influence. And I think the EU, maybe this, you know, channel of influence for for President Zelensky, because I still he sincerely believes in uh, Ukrainian future in Europe. He does. So I think he would be able. So so whenever you are using, you know, G7 ambassadors uh, statements or EU statements, I think this is support. This is support for Zelensky. This is support for civil society in Ukraine. So thank you for this support, Your Excellency. Oh, thank you, Alexei. So over to you, Ambassador. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, leaving aside now, uh, of course, the most important thing, uh, uh, which is ending the war and stopping people being killed. And within Ukraine, um, the judicial reform. Uh, I will not argue with Alexei whether about whether, uh, how, how much of a reformer Volodymyr Zelensky is or not, but uh, his leadership was challenged by the events of last fall by the Constitutional Court. So, so uh, he needs to respond, and he is responding. Uh, on the uh, on the on the um, external front, uh, I would only say uh, my wish is. Uh, for the EU and US coordinating under the Biden administration, and then together be a bit more proactive on Ukraine. Thank you. Great, thank you to, to all of you um, for joining us today. I think we've had a really great discussion. Um, obviously this issue of judicial reform is the thing that stands out and I think it's been standing out for quite some years. I don't remember any time when judicial reform, you know, wasn't the top priority. So I really hope that um, President Zelensky is listening and, you know, this will be the year when real progress is made on, on judicial reform. And we can say that Ukraine has an independent judiciary very, very soon. You know, I think we all wish for that. Um, so thanks again for joining us. I really valued all of your insights and comments. Um, we hope all the best for Ukraine. And um, thanks to the audience for joining us. Thank you for your questions. And I look forward to um, having you at another future event um, on Ukraine. In the meantime, I wish you all a great Friday uh, and a fabulous weekend. And everybody, please stay safe uh, and healthy in this COVID ongoing situation. Thank you all. Thank you, Amanda. Thank, thank, thank you very so much. much. Do, 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 do